Good morning. Good morning. This is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry, and this is the early morning light <laughs> Bible study. Talk about what you figured out yesterday. Well, it's just that it's 7 a.m. here in Arizona, and some of you may not know that the time never changes in Arizona. They opted out of daylight savings. So while some of you are listening at 7 and 8 and some 9 before, it's different. We used to do it on Central Time, and Central Time would still be 8 a.m., but it's 7 a.m. in Arizona. So we thought we better be consistent and always broadcast at 7 a.m. Good morning. Allison is up with her coffee. And um, so we just kind of had that revelation yesterday while we were teaching that even though we don't change in Arizona and we stay 7 a.m., other states have changed. We can't change it for every state, and we don't want to change it halfway through every year. Uh, so we're sticking with 7 a.m., and God bless you if you're up early enough. We know we are <laughs> to do broadcast. So, in, for instance, in Central Time, that's uh, it's 8 o'clock where all of our employees are, and you better be listening to the broadcast because there's going to be a test later. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> but the other side of it is is that people who are tuning in at the time they're used to listening, the broadcast is going to be there for them. Right. It just won't be live. We, we really did think about changing the time of the broadcast till we realized that someone who's tuning in, say they're used to coming in at 9 Central, the broadcast is going to be there, just not the live portion. Right. And so maybe what we're actually accommodating by keeping it at the sp- same time for us here in a time zone that never changes, there'll be people that are going to listen earlier that didn't get to have the live broadcast. Now they're going to get to. Right. And for the, all of you regulars, I expect you to adjust your schedule because we absolutely <laughs> miss you. Well, there's Allison. She's already adjusted. You know adjusted. who you are. <laughs> Dickie Lee, Lakeisha, all those precious all people. The different ones. Yeah, I was thinking because Paula La- Maddox. Because Lakeisha usually um, signs in while she's at work. First thing in the morning, it was nine o'clock, and now it's eight o'clock. She came in a little bit late yesterday, <laughs> so we kind of the Lord is helping us figure it out. We're going to go ahead and preach our ch- and teach our chapters anyway. <laughs> so today, uh, just FYI, we're in the midst of. Uh, doing a mentoring weekend and i get that it's not on the weekend we have a program called mentoring weekends that people fly in for several days for two three days of of mentoring ministry two days and we just take them and we pour into them usually it's one or two sometimes uh, it'll be a family and uh, and so that's what we're doing. We happen to be in uh, Phoenix uh, doing the mentoring right now. And it's something that, as I, I told the story, when it first happened, we had an attorney from Houston, Texas, uh, called us up. She was in the car. She says, I'm coming to Branson. I have to see you. And it turned into what we realized was a mentoring mm-hmm. session for a couple of days. And as we were ministering to this lady we realized this is a ministry we need to do, and we we opened it up. And so we're in Phoenix about two and a half hours from our home conducting morning light today. We're studying in Amos chapter 6, and if you want to know, I'm really not advertising the mentoring, but if you want to know more about that, uh, you can go to the website and look in the left-hand column and learn some about that. And uh, Amos 6, Samaria and Zion are reproved. In chapter 6 of Amos, the ruling houses of the northern and southern kingdoms of Israel are held accountable for their crimes against God. The impoverished are afflicted. The The people are convinced that they're too important to ever be allowed to fail. The courts of the day, back in this ancient culture of Israel and Judah, they were perverting judgment in astonishing dimensions. And for this reason, God declares that both houses of Israel be taken into captivity. 
and again, and it's dawned on me in studying Amos, and we've seen this as a theme, a minor theme, perhaps, in Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, but in Amos, it's repeated over and over and over again. God is reproving these nations at a time that there was relative prosperity in Samaria in the north of Judah and the south mm -hmm. at this time. And Amos is reproving them for their mistreatment and their neglect of the poor. And if you, if you thought, if somebody asked you, to, is there a book of the Bible that whose theme deals with the demand that we care for the poor? Before we got to Amos, honestly, for myself, I would have said, well, that's a theme that's in the Bible, various verses and passages. But this book, that is a primary core theme of the book of Amos. It's Amos speaking. He's a contemporary with Isaiah, and he's saying, look, God is going to deal with this culture for their mistreatment of the poor. And the magnitude with which it is emphasized in Amos is not reflected in the magnitude with which it is emphasized in Christian culture. Christian culture does not stress taking care of the poor in an equivalent magnitude with which Amos says it's important and if you don't do it, your nation will go into captivity. It's very sobering for me. I take it very personally because I've been taught my brother, Randall Walden, when, uh, I was, uh, when I was in the military, and he was three and a half years older than me, while I was in the military back in the late 70s, he was traveling the country, hitchhiking the country with a guitar on his back, mm -hmm. a Bible, and a, and a suitcase, preaching the gospel all over the Midwest. And when I got out of the military, I, I lived with my parents, and Randall, as my big brother, I have two big brothers, and Randall was staying with my parents who were pastoring in Lake Charles, Louisiana at the time. And Randall just, he mentored me in some things because I went and I was looking for work, trying to get settled into civilian life, and he would just take me along with him to meetings that he would preach or somewhere he'd go, and he mentored me. And one of the things he taught me, I wanted to give. And I didn't, at that time, I just got out of the military. I didn't have a job yet, so I didn't have finances. And, and Randy taught me. He said, uh, give out of your surplus. Give what you do have. If you don't have money to give, you can't give what you don't have. Give what you do have. Mm -hmm. Identify your surplus is what I call that today. And he taught that to me, and I've done that now for all this been 37 years. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and that I've always, whenever I felt constrained, you know, I get it. Sometimes you say, I don't have anything to give. Yeah, everybody's got something. It's true. Everybody's got a surplus of something. If you're unemployed, you can give your time. <laughs> Although you should be making a job out of getting a job. <laughs> but uh, it just speaks to me the deep need. I understand when, you know, in churches we stress you need to pay your tithes, you need to give in the offering. Yes, we do. But I think the first emphasis should be, and we've strived to do that here at Father's Heart Ministry. Look, giving and donations is what supports us financially. We have a lot of people that give, and today's not Friday. I know that. <laughs> but for me, God told me that giving to the poor validates what you give into the anointing. Amen. That if you're giving into the anointing or giving into the church, but you have not first given to the poor. See, the Levites, and I know I'm extemporaneous remarks, bear with me. In our study of the Old Testament, I saw that the Levites were giving 15.7% of their income to the poor. And then 10% of their income into the temple. Mm -hmm. Now you think about that. Imagine if that was the case. See, God never intended, in the economy of God, he never intended that government programs take care of the poor. And I'm not saying we shouldn't have government programs, because like they say about people that don't like women in ministry, and they say, well, where a man won't do a job, God will raise up a woman who will. Well, if the church won't do its job, God will raise up a government program that will, and whether they do that 
in fine fashion is a question. But it really just speaks to me, and we're going to see this as a theme in our chapter today. Kitty, if you'd read the entire chapter, uh, Amos chapter 6. Excuse me. <clears throat> Where's well, the mute button? <laughs> there isn't one. Maybe. The cough button, they call it. Oh, Amos 6 1. Woe to them that are at ease in Zion and trust in the mountain of Samaria, which are named chief of the nations to whom the house of Israel came. Pass ye into Kalna and see, and from thence go ye to Hamath uh, the Great. Then go down to Gath of the Philistines, be they better than these kingdoms, or their border greater than your border? Question. Ye that put far away the evil day, and cause the seed of violence to come near, that lie upon the beds of ivory, and stretch themselves upon their couches, and eat the lambs out of the flock, and the calves out of the midst of the stall, that chant to the sound of the viol, and invent, invent to themselves instruments of music like David, that drink wine in bowls, and anoint themselves with chief ointments, but they are not grieved for the affliction affliction of Joseph. The poor. Mm -hmm. Therefore now shall they go captive with the first that go captive and the banquet of them that stretch themselves shall be removed. The Lord God hath sworn by himself saith saith the Lord God of, of hosts I abhor the excellency of Jacob and hate his palaces therefore will I deliver up the city with all that is therein. And it shall come to pass, if there remain ten men in one house, that they shall die. And a man's uncle shall take take him up, and he that burneth him to bring out the bones of the house, and say, shall say unto him that is by the sides of the house, Is there yet any with thee? And he shall say, No. Then shall he say, Hold thy tongue, for we may not, for we may not make mention of the name of the Lord. For behold, the Lord commandeth, and he will smite the great house with breeches, and the little house with clefts. Horses, shall horses run upon the rock? Will one plow there with oxen? For you have turned judgment into gall, and the fruit of, the, of righteousness into hemlock. Ye which rejoice in a thing of naught, which say, we, Have we not taken to us horns by our own strength. But behold, I will raise up against you a nation, O house of Israel, saith the Lord, the God of hosts, and they shall afflict you from the entering of Hemath unto the river of the wilderness. In chapter 6, we find rebuke against Zion and Samaria for their self-confidence and their pride. The mention of Zion, usually they would say Jerusalem or Judah, but they're drilling down, talking about Zion, directs this rebuke specifically against the ruling house of the line of David and the elite of the king of Jerusalem. And just a note, at this time, uh, the it was Jotham who ruled after his father Uzziah. Remember, he was the king who died of leprosy because he presumed on the priest office and was struck with leprosy, and his son Jotham ruled in his place, and he was initially, in the beginning, a good king. He ruled as a regent uh, when his father was in the house of the leper, and then he became king, and he was not a bad king. But yet, Amos is saying that the judgment is going to come against the line of the kings of David. And here in their... DNA, Jesus himself was going to be brought forth by the promise of God. You realize that if the line of David had failed, that Jesus, the prophecies concerning the lineage of Jesus would have not come to pass. And so you would think that God at all costs would preserve the line of the kings of David. But yet he's saying he's going to chastise them. He's going to deal with them. Uh, Samaria's mention is in the shadow of this focus on Zion, in the context of the focus on Zion. Samaria in the north points to the ruling house of the ten northern tribes in view of the fact that Samaria, we call that 
the nation of Samaria or the Samaritans in Jesus' generation in his day because that was the city where the northern kingdom put its capital. And he says, Woe well, unto you that are at ease in Zion. And if you look that word ease up, it means uh, to be haughty, to be haughty, to be arrogant, to be presumptive in your own uh, sense of security or self-confidence, even though trouble looms. Because again, this entire chapter sits under the shadow of verse 1 that says, Amos said this two years before the earthquake came. And the point is, nobody listened. And Amos is saying, you, problems are coming. You need to do something. If you'll change now, you can avert some things. And it's, but it's, you know, it's, it's like you punctuate every line with two years before the great earthquake, 7.8 mm -hmm. on the Richter scale is what they suggest this earthquake in history. They know it happened. And uh, so trouble looms, but yet Zion and Samaria, they're completely assured in their own strength to deliver them. The question for us, because remember, this isn't a history lesson. First Corinthians 1.10, if you're going to memorize anything, because 1 Corinthians 1.10 validates the Old Testament record as being relevant to us. Every verse of the Old Testament says something to us because he said those things were recorded as an example to us on whom the ends of the age have come. Mm -hmm. Every verse is not given to give... God does not need to vet history, the sacred history. He put those things there because he's saying something to you and I. And you have to ask the question, was this saying to me? I'm glad you inquired. It's, the question for us is, what is our security? Would we be capable of identifying false security if we were looking to something other than God as our strength? Well, what produces an emotional response from us when it becomes unstable in our lives, when there's instability in our life and we have an emotional response to it, that's an, that is a marker in our character of a false confidence. Looking to something or someone for what we ought to be looking to God for. And in the midst of this, Amos is telling his listeners, hey, go look at the Philistines. Do you, are, are you greater in your strength? Do you have a bigger army, stronger borders than the Philistines? And at this time, the Philistines were defeated. He said, if the Philistines were defeated, what makes you think you're not going to be defeated? Because they could not say they were stronger than the Philistines, and the Philistines have been defeated. They couldn't say that. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, who do you think you are, is what Amos is saying. If God chastised the Philistines and you're doing the same thing, what makes they assumed that they could get away with what the Philistines didn't get away with because they were the children of Abraham. And this is what Jesus said. He said, do not think that you have Abraham to your father. Because God is able to raise up of these stones, mm -hmm. children to Abraham. And now we say, oh, well, we're of Christ. We're the evangelical community. We're born again. We're full gospel. I love that one. And you stop and think about that. To say, well, uh, I believe Jesus would say to our generation, don't think that you have Jesus to your Savior and that mm -hmm. makes you too big to fail. Because God could raise up of the rocks out here in this parking lot, born again people to fulfill his purpose. We, we really need to think about that. In other words, our, uh, our lineage, our spiritual lineage, in the case of the evangelical community, do, is, does not license us to sin after the similitude of nations such as in Samaria and Zion at this time. They were doing things that the Philistines did and got destroyed for, but they thought they would not pay a price because we are the children of Abraham. We are in the line of the kings of David. Mm -hmm. And they felt, whether they, it was ever a stated policy, they felt that they could get away with it. Mm -hmm. And we're going to see what they thought they could get away with. So the question is whether they considered themselves better than nations that were recently defeated and overrun. Mm. And then in verse 3, the prophet reproves them for thinking that the evil day, the day of their downfall, was so far away that there was no need to reform their ways. And 
you find people, and you think this is remote, but it really isn't. I'm astonished by how many people have been raised in church, their parents told them the right things, and they didn't want to live for God, and I have had people to my face tell me, I'm going to go out, I'm going to drink, I'm going to do drugs, I'm going to party, I'm going to, mm. I'm going to do whatever I want to do. And when the rapture takes place, I have no intention. If people all oh, don't believe in the rapture, I'm just telling you what they said. They would say, well, the rapture takes place. I have no intention of going in the rapture. But when the rapture takes place, I'll go get my AR-15 and I'll just go after the Antichrist and become a guerrilla fighter and give up my oh, life for the gospel God. and go to heaven. What kind of thinking right. is that? In other words, no, I have no need to change my life, and I'll work it out in the end, and I'll talk God into letting me get away with this because I'll do the right thing before I'm dead. You know, that's what Constantine did. Constantine was the emperor before whom uh, uh, they made uh, Christianity a protected state religion, and Constantine refused to convert. He did not get baptized until literally hours, if less than an hour before his death, because he wanted to sin, he wanted to do anything his way, oh, goodness. and then right before he died, bishops were begging him because they thought he was about to draw his last breath, and he held out until literally his last breath before he let them baptize him, and, ex and he accepted Christ. Till we call saved as by fire. <laughs> Now, the people are described in verses 4 through 6 as you're lying on beds of luxury, ivory beds. You're enjoying your favorite meals. You're singing and playing like King David himself. Mm. Think about that. I don't think we've ever had such stellar quality of worship music as we do today in Christianity. Mm -hmm. I mean, I love the old hymns. Right. And I... I love the music of years gone by, and it has a place in my heart, but you look at the talent and the skill and the gifting of hundreds upon hundreds of people today, mm -hmm. and they're very inventive, and that's what he's saying. You guys are so devoted to worship music, you're inventing instruments to extol praise unto God. And he's pointing this out. He says, yeah, you're because that's their objection. They're saying, hey... Look what we're doing for God. <laughs> Man, we're singing Jesus culture. We're doing this. We're doing that. And, but yet, the rebuke of Amos is, he said, yet you're not demonstrating any pity for the afflicted or the impoverished. And again, your, your regard for the poor is a metric of the character of your relationship with God. Amen. They thought it was the worship they were engaged in. They thought it was their piety in terms of observing feasts and doing these other things, getting involved in the protocols of religious lifestyle. But all of that was, was mentioned specifically in the last chapter and this chapter and completely... Uh, denigrated and, and set aside, and Amos is saying the only thing that God's measuring you by is your treatment of the poor. Now, you can look at other chapters, and they talked about idolatry and other things, but in Amos, this is like the 440 current of bare wire that you're touching, and he's saying, forget all these things you think you're doing right, that God's overlooking the sin in your life. He's saying it's your mistreatment of the poor that God's going to deal with the entire nation. That is so sobering to me because Amos emphasizes it to a degree that it is not stressed in Christian culture. Christian culture is not preoccupied with taking care of the poor. In fact, in most of the evangelical community, you'll hear people complaining about welfare programs that not only do they are they not doing anything for the poor, they're irritated because the government is. And they think that's not just. They need to get rid of that food stamp program. They need. We better stop and think. We better go read the book of Amos. <laughs> because of their heartlessness toward the poor. And, and I just urge you, I understand you may be one of those people. Go read the book of Amos for yourself. And, and I just, uh, as respectfully as I know how, I don't think you could read the book of Amos 
without realizing God expects us to have a different attitude than what is commonly found in the evangelical community toward the poor. Mm. Because of their heartlessness toward the poor, verse 7 declares that both royal houses, he said, because this is because you're enriching yourselves and ignoring the poor, he's telling the royal houses in Samaria and Zion, he said, you're going into captivity first. Before anybody else, you'll go into captivity. And that's exactly what happened. When the Assyrians came against the northern kingdom, the first thing they did before they took one captive out of the common folk in the city, they took the king captive, or they would take the king hostage back to Assyria in order to bring the population into submission. And they did the same thing when the Babylonians came to the southern kingdom. They took the king hostage, and both the northern king and the southern king died in captivity, held hostage as initially these invading armies, Assyria in the north and Babylon in the south, were trying to subjugate the people and make them obey because I've got your king and I'm going to kill him if you don't do what I say. And it's exactly what Amos prophesied was going to happen. Why? Because Amos says they, were, they had wanton neglect of the poor. It is amazing to me, this theme. I was looking at something about this. The other day I heard that uh, presidents make just under $200,000 a year for life. Did you know that Supreme Court justices make more than the President of the United States? Wow. They make two hundred around somewhere around two hundred forty, two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year for life. And we'll talk more about that another time. It just was interesting to me. And so it, it just speaks to me that the theme of advocacy for the impoverished is so marginalized in Christian culture and theology. You know, we all know various references about the widow and the fatherless, you need to visit them, the prisoner. But before I have prisoners that I personally correspond with and I personally support, that uh, I just it's in my heart. And they've committed terrible crimes. They've committed crimes that, that are, are egregious. But it's just God put it in my heart. You need to remember them. Amen. Think about our, our crime, the crime of our own sin that we were born with that nailed Jesus to the cross. What if, what if somebody had just grabbed up an innocent man and nailed him to, a, to a, 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 a wooden structure and let him die of exposure? Would you have mercy on that? Well, we all carry the guilt of that. And so I've, I've made it a point to not, not just give to some prison ministry. No, I'm personally doing something. Mm-hmm. For Kitty can tell you, I'm not boasting of myself. I'm telling you, I've dealt that with with. Con- I've been convicted that I must do this. Me personally, so many times we take our convictions and we toss a dollar or two into an institution. God does not hold institutions responsible to do these things. He hold holds us responsible, and so. From Amos' perspective, the attitudes of his day in neglect of the impoverished are one of the primary reasons why the two houses of Israel eventually fell to foreign invasion. Because of the cold hearts of the people, in verse 8, we find the Lord answers by himself. He said, I hate your prosperity. I hate your excellency. Imagine, (laughs) he's looking at the southern kingdom. I hate your excellency. He says, I hate your lofty palaces. Think about it. Think about the White House. Think about the governor's mansion. Think about the lifestyle of the elite in this country. He said, "I, I hate what you excel in. I hate how you've profited by it. Why? Because God wants us all to take a vow of poverty? There are people that think that way. There are people that think if you're going to live for God, it is obscene that you would ever expect to be prosperous as you are doing something for God. But yet they absolutely, they'll wear the, wear the jersey of an athlete in rehab and absolutely be prideful over the fact that he gets some billion dollar salary for what he does. 
That, that's perverse. The question is not whether or not you're prosperous. The question of, is in the midst of your prosperity, what are you doing for the poor? He said, because of this, in verse 9, he says, one in ten of you will die. And this is interesting. It's called decimation. We coined the term decimation. We'll say the, that population was decimated, which means we say it's just generally destroyed. But what it actually meant was that when an invading army would come in, after they would take the king hostage, if the people didn't capitulate, then the army would come in and randomly take one man in ten out of the entire population, randomly, hmm. and kill them. It comes from the, the word, the, the I believe it's the Latin word for ten. It's called decimus. It's decimating, killing one in ten. Hmm. And it came to pass. There came a time that Assyria killed one in ten. And it said, even your uncle is going to be trying to deliver you up to death to save his own skin. <clears throat> and it came to pass in Babylon, in uh, uh, the southern kingdom when Babylon invaded. In verse 11, the command of God is that the great house and the little house, Judah and Samaria, he said, you're both going to be smitten with breaches and clefts in the line of your kings. And as each of those kingdoms fell, if you remember the history when we studied it, their final administrations, the kings, the last few kings in the line of kings of the north and south, were not appointed by the natural successor, the the heir to the throne. They were completely set aside, many times were killed, and Assyria in the north and Babylon in the south came in and put up and put up puppet kings. In other words, a breach in the line of David. The second to last king in the line of Dave, in the line of David in Judah in the south was actually an uncle who was not in the direct line of David who was put who was put in power and they ignored the rights of succession and which is a terrible thing to them that would be like telling the Queen of England uh, Prince Charles or uh, after her or Prince Harry whichever one it is they're not going to be king I'm going to break the line of the kings of the house of Stuart. That would be a thing that English people would say, them's fighting words. you know. And that's what the came in. Can you imagine a prophet speaking in England and prophesying against government in England and saying that the line of the kings of England would be broken by the hand of God because they've neglected the poor? Wow. Very sobering. <clears throat> to the unspoken question as to why God would allow this, we're told in verse 12 that they turned to judgment. Now he talks about the judiciary into the gall of bitterness and the fruit of righteousness into hemlock. Now, what does it mean? Hemlock is, was something used to commit suicide. I remember a lady in Sweden several years ago who emailed us, and she's prophetic in nature and has a call of the prophetic on her life. She said to be prophetic in Sweden is like spiritual suicide. Mm -hmm. Even in the church, it turns you into a complete leper. In my nation, she told us. Oh, sad. Turning righteousness into hemlock. What about the courts of our day? So now he turns his attention. He's focusing on the courts. You have perverted justice, he says. The courts of our day, right here in our country, have they perverted justice? Mm -hmm. The courts are more interested in social engineering than executing justice for the oppressed. In verse 13, the judges of the day in Judah and Samaria are said to rejoice in a thing of naught. In other words, you've taken something that should not even be considered and you've made it the rule of the day and you've ground, you grind the faces of the people to accept the unacceptable. Boasting in their power to shape the nation by their unjust judgments. Listen, the arrogance of the high courts in our land is <coughs> astonishing. A lot of people don't don't realize, and this is so marginalized. And you just look it up. Just do. I've done the research. Do you know who gave us abortion and who took prayer out of schools? It was a Republican-dominated Supreme Court that passed down the decisions that took prayer out of schools and that made abortion the law of the land. That's right. And the Republicans have wiped their mouth and said they did nothing wrong and said it's them dirty old Democrats and if you'll just give us four more years, we'll fix it. And they appoint somebody like Neil Gorsuch, whatever, whoever Neil Gorsuch may be. We don't know who he is personally. 
We can't judge that. But we can look at his public statements. And when he was confirmed, he made a statement in April of last year, in 2016. He said that the Supreme Court, as the highest authority in the land, was, in his opinion, infallible. He said the Supreme Court is infallible and final in its judgments. Now, that level of hubris is absolutely astonishing to me. The magnitude of that, it's difficult to calculate that this man, for what, for whoever he is and whatever he is, he's, he wanted to put it on public record. His understanding of the authority of the Supreme Court, and he used language that for centuries has only been used to speak of the Bible as the infallible rule of life. Absolutely. And the Christian conservative demographic in this country stood and applauded and rejoiced and said, that's our man. Mama. Are we even listening? So, oh, who do you think? Brother Walden, you don't sound like a very good Republican. I've voted Republican ticket most of my life. But that doesn't mean that we close our eyes. Do we keep on smiling and say nothing? Do we keep on applauding and say nothing when they drift so far afield of those that claim to represent us that we say they can do no wrong because we've cast our lot in with them and believe they're the ones that are going to give us a ticket to what we want America to be? We better stop and think. Because the nation of Israel, of Samaria and Judah thought this way, God declares through Amos that he will raise up, he said, because you think this way, I'm going to raise up a nation against you that will afflict enslave and destroy you for your arrogance and pride. Oh, that's right. It was in his will to do that to Samaria and Judah. Hmm. But we're America, 90% of the gospel. I've heard it my whole life. 90% of the gospel is preached from America. God will never judge America. What an utter uh, uh, arrogant remark to make. Who do we think we are? That kind of thinking hastens a judgment that I think would otherwise be unnecessary Mm -hmm. because our country has such a high opinion of itself. We we are the moral center of the, of the globe and we're the ones that keep peace in the world. We're the ones that bring stability. We will, we will stand forever. Well, we better remember our foundations. Now, what can we take away for ourselves from this chapter? And it's like, wow, don't you have an axe to grind, Brother Walden? No, I don't. No, it's just Amos chapter 6. When I did Amos chapter 4, I (laughs) sent an email to one uh, one of the elder apostles that speaks into our life. I said, do I have permission not to teach on Amos (laughs) 4? No, we're just going to take each chapter as it comes. And whatever it says, it says. (coughs) And if it doesn't, conform to how we see things, then we have to decide, is this going to be a book of the people or are we going to be a people of the book? What's the takeaway for us? There's three things that he focuses on in this chapter. Number one, nationalism. We have to pause and realize that nationalism as a political sentiment is false security. Samaria and Judah considered themselves to be exceptional. Have you ever heard the term American exceptionalism? Because they considered themselves exceptional among the nations, that they could adopt the idols of the nations that got those nations destroyed, but because they considered themselves exceptional, they thought that they would never be dealt with. They did not think God would ever let their nation fall. For this reason, they allowed idolatry, sin, abuse of the impoverished to continue unchecked, thinking that in God's eyes, because they descended from Abraham, they were too big to fail. Is the church too big to fail? In the midst of a high-minded, self-serving modern culture, we must purpose as individuals. Now, you can't change what somebody else does, but you as an individual can say, I'm going to remember the poor. Taking care of the poor is not something you can relegate to a benevolence ministry or a local food bank. That's passing the buck. What are you personally doing for the poor, for the impoverished? 
God will never hold an institution or government program responsible for the plight of the impoverished. The accountability lies with us. And we personally, do you understand? One day we're going to stand before God and we're going to answer. And saying you gave to the March of Dimes is not going to do it. Saying you tossed a a can of canned corn into a bucket at Walmart on your way into shop is not going to do it. The accountability lies with us. We will personally, will answer to God for lives lived, leverage to the hilt to live in nice homes, drive decent cars, unless we make commensurate and personal sacrifices to care for those less fortunate than ourselves. We leverage ourselves into financial servitude with our credit maxed to the hilt for the home we live in, the cars we drive, the colleges we send our kids to. What are we doing for the poor? It's not that we don't understand sacrifice, but we're motivated to make it for ourselves to the exclusion of making it in defense of anyone else. Well, they could go out there and earn their, theirs just like I earned mine. I don't think that'll fly when the day of accountability comes to answer for that kind of thinking. Finally, we, we just have to commit to intercession. In other words, you got to say, I'm going to be a part of the solution, not part of the problem. And if nothing else, I know Kitty and I, when we pray in the morning, we're interceding for our president. We're interceding for, that's right, that's my president. I know the same people said, oh, Barack Obama wasn't my president. Well, the Bible says God puts him in power. Yeah. And so if the president is not a guy that you like, you better stop and change your mind about whether you believe the Bible is the word of God. Because I prayed for Barack Obama just like I'm praying for President Trump now. That's right. Finally, the, 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 our nation is in, is in peril. The hubris of our courts is obscene. Do you realize that what Neil Gorsuch said at his confirmation he- hearing about the infallibility of the court? That's a biblical definition of blasphemy, and the church applauded. If it were not for the high-minded of of our courts, we would not have same-sex marriage. We would not have abortion. We would not have excluded God from the public square. It's our courts doing this. We would not have encroachment of the homosexual political strength against our land. That's right. It's them courts, but yet it was the politicians we elected. Do you realize that 70% of the population of America identifies as Christian? You want to talk about a monolithic voting block? 70% of the population in our country, used to be 82%, identify as Christian. Therefore, the church in America bears more responsibility for the moral decay in our culture than any other people group. You cannot change someone else's mind. You can't change their mind. But you can change your mind. And that's not about going and posting a strongly worded Facebook post, folks. It's about what are you going to do to be a part of the solution, to intercede for our nation, to intercede for our judges and our courts to care for the poor. You can pray. You can intercede. For what? For the mercy of God to move in our nation, to turn the hearts, not just of the world. You can pray for the salvation of the lost, and I believe we should, but I think we need to understand just how far afield the church as a subculture, the culture of Christianity that names his name is so far afield that we've become a foundation for much of what we decry as wrong and immoral in our culture. We have to deal, and maybe you can't make someone else repent, but you can do like Nehemiah and stand up and repent for the sins of the nation. And I believe that if we don't, And we go on our way thinking that things are going to stay the way they've been and we're always going to be the primary superpower in the earth and all of that. I think we better think again. And if there doesn't come a fourth great awakening in the Western world, I believe we will live to see the day that this 
nation of ours as we know it will exist in a very, very different uh, geopolitical condition. So, Father, we thank you for Amos 6 today, and we thank you that you put on our hearts the heart that Jesus had, how he gave everything he had to bring redemption. Let us have a true heart of compassion, Father, for the poor, which is uh, very often the lost, but uh, among our ranks, Father God, let us be... uh, Let's go into our day, Father God, with eyes wide open so that we can see by the Spirit and make a difference where you show us to make a difference. It's the desire of our hearts, Father. Turn up the light so that we can see more clearly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.